President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for today's webinar. It's PH301, Troubleshooting. Uh, this is the third in a series of sessions on PH. The other two are posted to our website. Uh, so if you'd like to go back and review those, you can. Uh, this third one will be posted shortly, sometime later today. Uh, so you can review it as well. Today's presenter is Georgie Day. Georgie has spent the last 20 years providing field support for analytical instruments and sensors for customers and industries around the world. In her current role as Senior Analytical Product Specialist for Honeywell, she's been in just about every industry helping customers like you get the most of liquid analytical measurements. Georgie's worked at TBI Bailey and ABB, has a, uh, a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering, and lots of experience with pH. Because of the large number of attendees, we will be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there is a chat box that comes with the control panel for uh, GoToWebinar. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat box, and we'll get them addressed as soon as we possibly can. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Georgie and let her, uh, let her give us the Halloween presentation of pH. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to PH301. Uh, it's definitely a Halloween presentation because we're going to talk about your worst pH nightmares today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just start on in. Um, I like to always start these sessions, since it's not PH101, I like to start the session with a review. Uh, if you have attended uh, either one of the previous sessions, uh, you can actually uh, multitask or take a little snooze now. or participate in the review in case you've forgotten some of the things that we've talked about. So we have a couple of slides of review and then we'll hop right into all the aches and pains that you're likely experiencing with your pH equipment. So the review is just on how pH sensors work so that we can uh, have a good idea of how to diagnose what the problems are when you run into them. So pH sensor is like a little chemical battery. It's a voltage source. It generates its own millivolt signal regardless of whether it is connected to an instrument or not. And that's part of the reason why pH sensors have a shelf life, because they're already using up their active sites on their, uh, on their glass measuring electrodes. Um, they're a two-electrode device. You have a measuring electrode, which changes uh, its voltage potential depending on the pH of the sensor, the solution. And you have, uh, it will either be made of glass uh, with active sites, or it'll be an ISFET, an ion-sensitive field effect transistor. That is uh, Honeywell's version of that is a DuraFed, and we were actually the patent holders on the industrial FED. The measuring electrode is responsible for your span and response. So if you have a problem when you put the sensor into a 4 buffer and then a 7 buffer, and instead of getting 3 pH units in between, you only get 2.5, that's a span issue, and that has everything to do with the measuring electrode. Or if you put the sensor into a 4 and a 7 buffer, and it is slow coming from the 4 pH to the 7 pH, that's a response issue. And that's also an issue with the measurement electrode side of the sensor. The uh, second electrode is your reference electrode. And the reference electrode is there to maintain a constant voltage so that your varying voltage at your measuring electrode has something constant to compare to. Uh, it also has to be there to give you a complete circuit so that current flows through the sensor. Uh, whenever you're measuring a voltage, you need to have two poles, like if you're measuring your car battery voltage, and I gave you a multimeter with only one lead, and you, I said go out and measure your voltage on your battery, you wouldn't be able to do it because you have to have a lead on both uh, the positive and the negative uh, poles on your battery so you can see that voltage drop across the two points. And it's the same with the pH sensor. You have to have that second uh, a voltage pole, like your reference electrode, to be able to complete the circuit. If you have an offset in your reading, uh, like if you put your sensor in a 4 buffer and a 7 buffer, it measures 4.5 and 7.5, and, and, uh, and it's speedy, that means the response is good, it's got the right span of 3 pH units, but it's off by half a pH on both values. That's an offset. Uh, an offset is related to the health of the reference electrode and the reference side of the sensor. Um, so if you have an offset, then we have to address the reference side. 
And then there's also a third uh, electrode in 99.9% .9 of pH sensors, and that would be your temperature uh, electrode. And that is in there not to control temperature, but to see the temperature and do a compensation through the Nernst equation, because uh, the voltage that the sensor puts out varies when the temperature changes. OK, so we'll look at the next slide. So if you look at your pH sensor, you can see the components I was just speaking about. You're measuring electrode. You have a pH 7 uh, buffer solution uh, behind a pH sensitive glass that has all the active sites on it. And then your silver silver chloride wire. And this uh, device changes voltage depending on the uh, pH of the solution. At 7 pH, it has 0 millivolts because you have a seven, approximately 7 pH buffered solution on the inside. 7 at your solution on the outside, so you don't have any voltage. It's 0 millivolts. At 6 pH, you're going to have uh, 59.165 millivolts, or 59 millivolts approximately. Um, at 5 pH, 118 millivolts. If you go above 7 at 8 pH, you get 59 negative millivolts. Uh, at uh, 9 pH, you're up to minus 118, et cetera. So you have this measuring electrode that varies voltage depending on the solution value. Um, <clears throat> it's a high impedance electrode, so you have to connect it to a high impedance voltmeter. That's why you can't take a pH sensor and just plug it into your multimeter. Uh, you would lose, you'd have too much signal loss. So we have a high impedance voltmeter, and that's your instrument. And because we have to have two poles, we have to have a reference electrode. So here's your reference electrode. It's also silver silver chloride to match the silver silver chloride in the measuring electrode. Uh, the problem is you can't just put it in the process bare like that because it would, A, not have a constant voltage to compare to, and B, it would probably be damaged by your process fluid. So we put it in uh, a fluid or a gel of potassium chloride. And that potassium chloride is an electrolyte, so it carries current very readily. And it fixes the, uh, the voltage at the reference electrode. And that's great, but now you're not connected to the process. You're separated from the process, so you don't have a complete circuit. So the last thing we do is at the bottom of that, we put a liquid junction that is a porous material. Uh, some of our sensors have a porous ceramics, some porous Teflon. There's other porous materials. You could use wood or uh, I've seen porous Kynar, all kinds of stuff. But for our Honeywell's electrodes, we use either ceramic or Teflon, depending on the style of sensor you're getting. So that's what a traditional uh, two-electrode pH sensor looks like. And they're all built in that way with some variations in the reference, some variations in the measuring electrode. OK, so what might be happening out there in your pH headache lives? The most common uh, problem I get hit with from customers, either phone calls or when I'm on site, is the pH, my pH in my process doesn't match my grab sample. And that's really, really common. If you're suffering from that problem, you are certainly not suffering alone. Um, most of the time, it is a case of comparing apples and oranges. You're looking at fruit on both ends, but they're not the same kind of fruit. If you have a process, especially a process that's hot, um, when you measure that pH and it's hot, the pH value in that solution is going to be different if the, if the fluid cools off. So if you're pulling a grab sample or the lab comes out once a day or once a week, and has a cart and pulls a bunch of samples every place, marks them up. Maybe they do a really good job. They have nice, clean beakers, and they have covers for them so that everything's covered. But by the time they get back to the lab, it's cooled off 10, 15, 20 degrees. Uh, and they measure it, and it doesn't match. And it doesn't match because the solution is chemically different than the solution that you measured in the process at the, ver at the different temperature. So um, so they're chemically different. And there's two types of temperature effects. One is the Nernst effect. And that's the reason that you have your TC, is to compensate for what's called the Nernst effect. And I'll explain that in detail a little bit better here in a second. The other is the solution effect. And you can't compensate, in general, uh, using your temperature compensator for the solution effect. 
So let's take a look at those two effects. Um, the NERST effect just says that the output of the pH sensor changes when the temperature changes. And so when we calculate pH from the millivolt signal, there is a temperature component, as you can see up here in the uh, equation. There's a temperature component in there to adjust for temperature. So when I told you a few minutes ago that your electrode puts out approximately 59 millivolts per pH unit, um, that's only at 25 degrees C. It's not true at other temperatures. But the relationship between the millivolt output of any pH sensor, regardless of the solution it's in, and temperature is well documented. And so we can do what we call temperature compensation. So if you're running at 50 degrees C, and you're at 6 pH, you're going to see the instrument will see a signal of 64 millivolts. But because it knows it's at 50 degrees C, and that's plugged into the Nernst equation, when the instrument sees 64 millivolts, it will automatically put it in there, and it'll come out with a pH of 6. If you're at uh, a pH of 5 and you're at 50 millivolts, then it'd be 128, or 50 degrees C, it'd be 128 millivolts. So the Nernst effect says that we can, that the electrode output changes with temperature change. As the temperature goes up, the electrode output is higher, and the millivolt output is higher. As the temperature goes down, the millivolt output is lower. But it is fixed, it never changes, and we can compensate for that. So that's what your temperature compensator does. The solution effect, however, is completely different. And I have an example for you. Um, this is my favorite example because everybody knows water. We understand water and we can think about water all together and, and sort of get a good picture of what's going on. So if you have water that is 100% pure, doesn't have any contaminants whatsoever, and it's in a sealed environment because the minute you open it to the atmosphere, it will start contaminating. Uh, certainly if it's around a, you know, a salesperson like me, uh, all that hot air coming out, all that CO2, that's going to contaminate your water and cause the pH to go down and the conductivity to go up because it dissolves in the water. So we want to keep this completely sealed in our example. So we have uh, some perfectly pure water. It's sealed. It's at 25 degrees C. It's in a pot with a glass lid. And we're going to take it and we're going to put it on the stove and light a fire under it. And as that water starts to get warm, uh, if you've ever looked in your pan at the water when you're boiling it to make pasta or, or whatever, you'll notice that what happens initially is you see these little tiny bubbles start to form, usually down at the bottom of the pan on the surface. And then pretty soon they'll start trickling up. Those bubbles are oxygen. They're O2 molecules. And what happens is, if you're looking at just pure water, you have H2O. You have an H connected to an O connected to an H. That's what the molecule looks like. And when you heat it up, because it's only weakly bonded, uh, hydrogen bonded, those hydrogen ions come off. And the two oxygen ions want to get together and form O2. So that's what those bubbles are. Well, for every O2 you're forming, you have two hydrogen ions floating around in your solution. And when you measure pH, basically you're counting hydrogen ions. And the more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the solution. So as those bubbles form, you get more and more oxygen, which we don't care about, but we get a lot more free hydrogen ions floating around the solution. So at 100 degrees C, your pH goes down to 6.13. And this is the solution effect, the temperature compensator doesn't know anything about the chemistry of your solution. It only knows that the temperature has changed. So at 100 degrees C, it's going to be putting out about um, 70 millivolts per pH unit, approximately. Uh, and it will be compensating for 100 degrees C in the Nernst equation. But it can't compensate for what's happening chemically in your solution, in this case, pure water. And the solution effect is greater or smaller depending on your process fluid. If you look at these process fluids that I have up on the screen, and I know you don't care about you know, uh, the pH of pulp mill black liquor unless you work in a pulp mill, or chlorine dioxide solution, or the pH of Lake Michigan, which I hear had 20-foot waves yesterday. 
Uh, but if you look at, let's look at the pH of Lake Michigan, at 20 degrees C, the pH is generally about 9.8. But if you raise that temperature of this same fluid, you haven't done anything else to it except raise the temperature, it's going to drop down to 8.8. .8. So that's a change of a whole pH unit across the, um, across the temperature range here, 60 degree temperature change. Um, and you can see that the pH drops as the temperature gets higher. The same thing with the pulp mill black liquor. It drops from 13 and a half almost down to 12. But something that you need to notice on this chart, if we look at the chlorine dioxide solution, you will see that it starts at just under 4, but then it, it raises almost to 4 and a half. So probably about a 0 0.6 change over 80 degrees, but it's going up. So you can't just create a fudge factor for, OK, my process solution is you know, 60 degrees higher than when I pull a grab sample and get it back to the lab to measurement. Um, because you don't know if your solution is always going to drop or always going to go up. It depends on the chemistry. Um, so there are instruments like the UDA 2182 that will do uh, temperature compensation, what we call solution compensation, for particular uh, instances, ones that we know very well, like boiler feed water with a particular chemistry. So if you actually want to solution compensate and know what that pH would be live if it were at 25 degrees C, then you go in and turn on the solution temperature compensation and you choose your how you are treating your water, maybe ammonia or morpholine or depending on you know what your treatment is, because these are and then these are exact instances and there's no weird chemical changes because you've chosen your your treatment regime. Uh, we can actually compensate and tell you what the reading would be at 25C when you pull a sample and take it off to the lab and it cools off. So you have to be careful of the temperature effects on process solutions. And just as an added note, temperatures also affect buffers. When you do a buffer calibration, you need to put the buffer value into the instrument at the temperature that um, that buffer is. And you need to make sure that your buffer value, your buffer temperatures are the same as your process, your grab sample temperature, and the same as the temperature of your sensor. If you pulled your sensor out of a hot process, you probably should let it cool off to your buffer temperature before you try to make your calibration. And you can see that buffers change a great deal. A, a 6.87 buffer doesn't change much over 0 to 60 degrees C, as well as a 4.01 buffer doesn't change much between 0 and 60 degrees C. But you can see a 9.18, which is a very common buffer, changes quite a bit. Uh, half a pH, and a 12 buffer, 12.45 buffer, changes a full pH unit between 0 and 60. So even buffers that are designed to hold their pH value uh, in a variety of circumstances are still going to have a different value at different uh, temperatures. So you have to be careful of the solution effect. And a lot of people get bitten on that when they're doing grab sample calibrations because they're pairing, comparing it to uh, the same sample at a different temperature. Now, sometimes you can take that sample and reheat it in the lab, heat it back up to process temperature. However, you have to be careful with that because there is no guarantee that it's going to follow the same chemical and thermodynamic path. So you may be turning it into its chemical A. When it's in the process, it cools off and turns into chemical soup B. And when you reheat it, you might get chemical soup C because it may cause the chemistry to change yet again and not go back. Uh, because there are those thermodynamic chemical properties when you're going from hot to cold back to hot again. Uh, so you have to be careful with that. But sometimes you can do a little fudge factor that way. It just depends on your process. So the other thing that can cause your uh, sensor to your grab sample not to match is if you have a ground loop. Um, and ground loops are very tricky. Um, if you have a ground loop, you, what happens is you measure the process and you pull a grab sample and maybe they're off by half a pH. And no matter what, they're always off by half a pH. And something that you can do to test if you have a ground loop is to take the sensor out of the process and put it in a beaker of the process fluid and see if it's giving a steady reading. 
The other thing is, when you take that sensor out of the process and put it in a glass beaker, glass or plastic beaker, so you're isolated, um, and you put it in the process, if it reads what it's supposed to read versus what it's reading in the process, that is a really good indication that it's a ground loop. A lot of times I'll get a customer that will call and say, well, when I take it out and I put it in buffers, it reads the buffer correctly, but when I put it in the process, it's not right because I pull a grab sample and it doesn't match and I'm doing the grab sample right there with a portable instrument, et cetera. And so what I say is take the sensor out and put it into that process fluid that you just pulled as a grab sample and tell me if it now matches your handheld, because if it does, that is a really good indication that you have a ground loop. And what a ground loop is, is you have stray voltage in the process that is causing current to flow between the pH sensor and the instrument that doesn't belong there. Uh, when you make a pH measurement, the sensor is counting on the process fluid to be at Earth's ground. So all you see is just the voltage of the, uh, the actual voltage of the process depending on the pH. And remember, we're measuring millivolts here, we're, or generating millivolts here, so the whole pH scale is less than one volt. So if you have extra voltage in there, that's going to cause extra voltage to write on the signal and give you a screwed up pH measurement. So you have to determine if you have a ground loop. One thing you can do is take your process fluid and put your sensor in it and then take a ground, ground strap or grounded wire, it's got to be grounded to earth ground, a good earth ground, and drop it in that beaker of fluid. If you see the reading jump, that means you absolutely have a ground loop. If it doesn't jump, that doesn't mean you don't have a ground loop. Unfortunately, it's only a positive test. It's not a negative test. But if either of those two things happen, it jumps or it reads correctly in that beaker, but it doesn't read correctly in the process, you have a ground loop. And it could be caused by a variety of things. Ground loops for on pH sensors are notoriously hard to find because you're probably looking for just some millivolts, especially like if you have, if it's off by, say, half a pH unit, that's only 30 millivolts. That's not very much. <laughs> so it is. it can be very, very difficult to find. Um, a lot of times it can be, if you never had the problem before, but you're having the problem now, it could be maybe a mixer uh, has, maybe somebody's put a p new piece of equipment on. That's usually the case. Or you have an old piece of equipment, like a mixer in a tank, um, and you notice you go out and you turn the mixer on and off, and you notice that you have a problem when the mixer is going, but not when the mixer is off. That means that you've developed some sort of faulty ground issue with the uh, mixer, and it could be intermittent. You know, it could be grounding and then not grounding. Um, if it's a new application and you're in plastic pipe, you're going to have to put some sort of metal rod in there, a sacrificial metal rod, next to the pH sensor to ground the fluid right next to the pH sensor. So you just got to chase it around. I've done a lot of ground loop chasing, so you know if you have troubles, get a hold of the guys at Lesma, and we'll all get hooked up, and and we'll work through it. Okay. Sometimes you get your pH stuck on a single value. That is almost always broken glass. Uh, that means that there is a direct short between the measuring electrode and the reference electrode. You can imagine that if the um, glass is broken, uh, if the bulb is, is snapped off, that's very obvious. You pull it out and you go, oh, well, it's no good, throw it away, put in a new one. But sometimes you can get hairline cracks that you can't see in your measuring electrode unless you put it under a microscope. And that hairline crack is just enough to let fluid enter there, and then you just get that dead short. The other place you can get it is inside the body of the sensor. If you're using a glass measuring electrode, um, it is a pH sensitive glass that is annealed or welded to a Pyrex stem. And that stem is completely surrounded by the reference solution and the reference electrode. So if you get a crack in that glass inside the sensor, um, it will develop a very slow leak. And when that finally gets connected, you're connecting the reference to the measuring electrode and it will stick. It will many times stick someplace close to seven, but not always. Um, and as I said, a lot of times you can't see that. But there are some electrical checks you can do. Um, another thing that can happen is your pH wandering 
uh, all over the place. No matter what you put it in, it just is wandering all over the place. And that can also be broken glass, uh, again, or it could be a ground loop. Some ground loops, when you, have, you get this varying voltage in the process, and of course that causes the pH sensor just to wander all over the place. Um, you can have a slow responding pH sensor. That usually means that the sensor is dirty or it's dying. Um, and the only way to know what, whether it's dirty or dying is to clean it. And what you're going to clean the pH sensor with depends on uh, what the sensor is crapped up with. If usually, in general, if you're in a uh, basic or alkaline uh, process where you're above 7 pH, usually a mild acid, like maybe 5% hydrochloric, is a good cleaning agent. Uh, you wouldn't want to soak more than 5 or 10 minutes and then rinse it real good. If you're in an acidic process, uh, you may have to use a base. And if you use something like a sodium hydroxide solution, you're probably going to have to get under a fume hood and warm it up a little bit because bases don't clean very well. They're not very reactive uh, without heating them up. But depending on what your, your uh, process is, is leaving on the sensor, you'll have to figure out what to use. I can help you with that as well. Uh, you have to clean the sensor, and then you retry it in your buffers and see if it is getting quicker uh, and more accurate. If it's not, then probably it needs to be replaced. And at that point, you want to ask yourself, hmm, maybe I'm not cleaning this enough. I should clean it more often and adjust your maintenance schedule to deal with that. The other thing that can cause a slow response, which I've seen happen occasionally, this is not a big one, uh, is that someone has put some damping or delay uh, in the instrument on the measurement because maybe it's noisy or you know they just they only want to take a measurement so often. Um, you want to disengage the damping or the delay and retry. And with that thought in mind, let me just say that it's a dangerous thing sometimes to put a delay on a pH measurement because pH is a logarithmic function. And that means it can go from okie doke to, oh, we're in big trouble really quickly if it gets up on the steep part of that um, curve. So it's very, very unusual where you would want to put any delay in your pH measurement because that could cause you a whole other set of headaches. Uh, sometimes you see a high offset. Um, when you have your pH sensor in a process, and I don't know, you calibrate it once a week and you have to calibrate it um, you know, by a tenth and then next week you have to calibrate it by a tenth. And what's happening is the pH reference is becoming poisoned. And it can become poisoned by a variety of process fluids getting in and mixing with the potassium chloride in the, in the, process, in the uh, reference side. And it can also be getting poisoned by things like sulfides and cyanides which are ions, and those ions uh, exchange with the, the chloride ion on the silver-silver chloride reference electrode. And they cause a higher voltage potential to be there. And that higher voltage potential at the reference, of course, causes you to have an offset. If you had 30 millivolts of uh, extra voltage potential in there, if it was 30 millivolts positive, then you would be off by uh, minus a half a pH which is fairly significant. So, and you can tell if you have an offset problem if, you, if the sensor is in the process and you grab sample calibrate it and everything looks right, but if you take it out and put it in a 4 buffer and a 7 buffer, let's say you have 30 millivolts of offset, because the math is easy for me, uh, when you put it in a 4 buffer, it would measure, if it was uh, 30 millivolts positive, then in the 4 buffer it would measure 3.5, in the 7 buffer it would measure six and a half. So you have an offset. It's measuring, it uh, has a three pH span between the two buffers, but it's off by half a pH. But when you put it in the process, it's measuring the process correctly. And you know that because you've pulled a grab sample and measured it right there, and it matches with your uh, handheld or your portable device. So what that means is that you are building a voltage potential in the reference, and at some point it's going to become poisoned enough that you won't be able to um, calibrate that offset out, and then you have to throw it away and get another one. If that happens frequently uh, in your process, you might want to look at changing to a different reference technology. 
Um, there are a variety of reference technologies, bigger reference electrodes, uh, references that are more towards a solid state rather than uh, you know, a slurry or a gel. Uh, gels are the most common. Maybe you can go from a gel to a polyacrylamide, which is more of a solid, or even go into something solid like our HB sensor, which actually has uh, a wood substrate inside. So there's a variety of things that you can do uh, to combat that. But first, you have to diagnose what the problem is. Um, there are some electrical checks that you can do on your sensor to find out um, what the problem might be. Uh, if you're having a temperature compensation issue, if you think, if it doesn't look like it's reading the temperature correctly, and you've tried a calibration uh, on the temperature compensator, and most modern instruments will allow you to do that, uh, then you need to check the TC. Because usually with a temperature compensator, it, it's either pretty accurate or it just goes completely haywire, like you get the temperature of the sun or, or something. You know, it's just a crazy temperature. But what can be the problem is you've got a TC in there, and your instrument is not set up for that particular temperature compensator. So you can check that just by using a multimeter, uh, to put the sensor in air, and then uh, just check across the two temperature compensation leads. And at about 25 degrees C, uh, you, your temperature compensator should be about the value that it's uh, defined as. So if you have an 8550 TC, uh, you should see about 8,550 ohms. Now, if you're not right exactly at 25C, it'll be a little bit off, but it's, it's going to be very, very minor. If you have a PT-1000 TC, you should see 1,000 ohms. If you have a PT-100, 100 ohms, et cetera. Uh, so that's how you can test the TC. Um, to test the isolation, to see if you're getting a short between some of the wires in there, like if you maybe have a crack in the glass inside the sensor and you just can't, see it, um, but it's not behaving right, you can check between each TC wire against each pH sensor wire. So you take TC wire 1, check it against the measuring electrode wire, then check it against the reference electrode wire, and then TC2, and check the two wires as well. You should have no, uh, no conductance at all. You should have complete isolation between those wires. And when you're doing these checks, of course, the sensor is disconnected from the instrument. Uh, if you're using a glass measuring electrode, you can check the glass impedance. The impedance on the electrode uh, when it's in the solution should be somewhere between 200 and 300 mega ohms. If you're using one of our HB sensors, you're probably going to be up around 600 mega ohms because uh, it's very high impedance. If you get infinite resistance, uh, then you probably have a broken electrode. Um, if you get very low resistance, um, you're losing, you've lost a lot of the face of the sensor. Maybe you've got a process that has occasional hydrofluoric acid in it or something, and it's breaking down the uh, glass. It's getting thinner and thinner. Uh, so you can look at the impedance. Uh, and again, you just take the, uh, put the, your multimeter on the measuring electrode wire and then drop the other end right into your process fluid that you've got it in, or your beaker process fluid. Uh, reference resistance, uh, you can check that. Again, you just uh, put the lead on the reference electrode wire and then drop it in the solution. That uh, reference should be less than about 300 K ohms. Uh, anything above that tells me that your reference is getting poisoned or compromised in some way. And so we'd have to take a look deeper to see if we could figure out what the issue is. OK, what else do we have here? OK, um, you can do some electrical checks on your instrument if you think there's something, if it might be the instrument. The most common problem with pH loops is the sensor, because it's the, you know, the sacrificial device. It's your razor blade. You have to throw it away and replace it. And lots of things happen to it because it's in the process. But sometimes it's the instrument, once in a while. So you can uh, make sure that you, have, that you haven't lost your isolation on your input card. So if you take a multimeter, Tag it on to signal common on the uh, input card or the pH board. Uh, and you'll have to look up in your instrument manual where signal common is. And then just drop the other lead down to a good earth ground. Um, and you should have isolation. You shouldn't see any conductance there at all. 
Uh, you can also do an electrical check for the input. If you have something that will uh, generate millivolts, then you can actually put in millivolt values, um, you know, disconnect the pH sensor, uh, connect up the millivolt source, and generate millivolt values, and drive it to specific pHs. You can also do those tests inside most modern instruments, like our UDA 2182. If you go into the maintenance screen, you can pull up some test values where you can uh, test it to see how the input's working and how the output is working. But you can also put, hook up a millivolt generator to make sure your input card is working correctly. And you generate, say, minus 59 millivolts should be 6 pH. I'm sorry, minus 59 millivolts should be 8 pH. Minus 118 should be 9 pH, et cetera. And then below 7, the opposite. If you don't have a millivolt generator and you just want to take a quick swag at it, I always carry paper clips. Uh, because I fly a lot, I don't carry little bits of wire because it makes the TSA a little bit nervous. So I always carry a couple paper clips. And if you disconnect your pH sensor, the measure and reference, and put the paper clip across the measure and the reference, you're now a direct connection, which means you have zero millivolts across that terminal, and zero millivolts is 7 pH. Um, so when you do that with your instrument that you're having a problem with, Keep in mind that you've put some, you may have put some offset and some slope changes into that instrument by doing calibrations with your sensor. So it wouldn't be exactly seven, but I would think that you would be within like eight tenths to a full pH unit close to seven when you put that paper clip across. So and that's a that's an easy, quick uh, trick that you can do just to take a peek at it. Okay, uh, I was talking earlier about doing uh, calibrations and comparing apples to apples, et cetera. Uh, a note on portable pH meters that you can use to do your grab samples. Your lab or your portable pH sensor uh, should have a reference technology that is similar or the same to the reference technology that you're using in your process. I would say that most of the time in your process, um, unless you're in a high purity pH situation in a power plant for boiler water, you're probably, your pH sensor hopefully has at least a gel fill or a polymer fill. Maybe it has a solid type reference like DHB. So you would want your, your portable to have probably a gel or a polymer type reference fill as well. If you're in a high purity situation, then you're using, you are using high purity pH sensor, which requires a uh, liquid potassium chloride uh, that is being fed through a reservoir into your uh, flow cell. And then in that case, you would want a uh, portable pH sensor that has uh, a flowing reference or liquid or slurry inside. And you can, always, you can almost always look at portable pH sensors. They're either plastic tubes or glass tubes, and you can shake them around and see what's inside there in the main tube. Um, peculiarities of high purity water, I just want to hit this real quick because um, that's also a problem that I see very commonly out there in some power plants is that when you take a grab sample uh, of boiler feed water, um, water that's below 10 microsiemens, it is very, very ultra sensitive to contamination because there aren't very many ions in there. It's super clean. And if you are uh, taking a grab sample and you just pull the sample and then walk over to the counter and put your, uh, your portable device in there, the likelihood is it's going to be different than what you're reading online. What you're reading online is sealed from the atmosphere. When you open that uh, sample to the atmosphere, what happens is uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolves inside, and it lowers the pH, makes it more acidic, and it raises the conductivity. And it happens really fast. And if you have, and if you're standing over that beaker and you're breathing out into it, uh, it will happen even quicker because we breathe in oxygen, we take oxygen out of the air, and we expel carbon dioxide out of our lungs which is why everything is more acidic when you've got a room full of salesmen, because we're all full of hot air. So you have to do a, what's called a flowing, um, a flowing sample. And that flowing sample is really easy to do. You, just, you have to have a sample line that is flowing out of your 
um, out of your pure water uh, device, and there's usually usually they're already set up with samples flowing out into a big sink. And then you take that sample tube and put it at the bottom of the beaker, and uh, you put your pH sensor, and if you have a separate temperature compensator, you pop that in. You put your portable pH sensor in there, and everything is at the bottom of the beaker, and you let it overflow at least turn over about three times. And then you know that all the contamination is in about the top quarter to the top third, uh, whereas you're getting actual a real reading at the bottom. So then you get a good grab sample that way, and then you can make your adjustment on your live reading. So you have to have a flowing sample for that. OK. That's all I have for you right off the cuff, but I am ready to field your questions. Georgie, you must have answered all the questions, because in the question box, I don't have any at the moment. Wow, or everybody, or I was so fabulous, everybody conked out. <laughs> <laughs> it can't. It can't be that because as you started off, the, you know, it is Halloween and pH problems can be very scary. They are very scary. Uh, Georgie, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. If there is anybody in the audience that does have a specific application question please feel free to give me a call at 800-9-LESMAN or 800-953-7626. And feel free to ask for me directly, Mike DeLaCluse, and I'll make sure that you get taken care of. Uh, our next uh, webinar has not currently been announced, so stay tuned to your email, and we'll send out an announcement as to what our next subject is going to be. Uh, now that I am getting ready to close it, there are some good questions. So let me let me go through the questions here. Uh, John Nelson, let's see. Uh, could some problems be resolved by using antimony probes? Ah, that's a good question. Um, antimony probes, when you use an antimony sensor, it's because you're down to the last gasp effort. Um, typically, antimony is used in a process, most commonly, that has hydrofluoric acid in it. Hydrofluoric acid is um, an etching solution, and it will etch glass, like if you get a set of um, champagne glasses for your anniversary and it has your names uh, carved into it, that's done with hydrofluoric acid. So you can imagine that if you put a device like a pH sensor with a glass measuring electrode, or even a FET, because some of the components of the FET are silica-based, um, it will take that sensor out. Basically, it just eats, eats off the whole face of the sensor, and then it dies. So if you're in a process like that, you can use an antimony sensor. Antimony is a real pain in the rear because it, is, um, it, has, a lower, it has a lower voltage to uh, millivolt ratio than a regular sensor. And its isopotential point, the place where it's zero millivolts, is at minus one pH. So the instrument that you use has to be set up for it. And it will, antimony sensors are usually required in a, hydro, a solution that has hydrofluoric acid in it where you're below uh, about 5.5 pH. Above 5.5 pH, the hydrofluoric acid is not uh, reactive enough really to bother the glass. Uh, but if you're below 5.5 pH, then antimony could be used. Uh, you have to clean it a lot. You have to take it out, and you have to take sandpaper, and you have to refresh the face of it because it gets what's happening to be able to make that measurement is it's getting oxidized on the face. But yes, antimony can solve a problem if you're losing your pH sensors because the uh, glass is being eaten away. Now, I, do, I can't think of another process where I've ever used an antimony sensor other than something that has hydrofluoric acid. And hopefully, John, that'll fix you up. And that is was one of his comments, is that we use HF. So yes. uh, that, that is part of that equation. Yeah. All right, another question we have is uh, from Craig. Do you know if USP states anything about not using temperature compensation? And is it a better idea to use temperature compensation? OK. In general, 
uh, when you measure pH, you must use temperature compensation. If you don't have temperature compensation, I should have put that graph in there. I debated in my process, in my presentation. If you don't use temperature compensation and you're away from 25 degrees C, you're going to have an error in your measurement in general. This is the general answer, and then I'll uh, tell you, give you an answer on specific USP. So if you are, let's say you're at, um, let's say you're at, 30 degrees, 35 degrees C, and you're at 5 pH, and you don't use temperature compensation, you're going to have an error of 0.06 uh, pH units. If you're at uh, 35 degrees C and you're at 2 pH, you're going to have an error of 0.15 pH units. Now, let's say you're at 85 C and 2 pH, you are going to have an error of 0.9 pH units. So you always, always use temperature compensation. However, when you're doing a uh, USP certified measurement, and uh, our UDA 2182 uh, has the USP um, uh, programming in it, uh, there's several ways that you measure and do your calculation. Um, you measure your, and usually, well, let's see. Let me think about this. Usually you temperature compensate your pH, and you measure for USP water, the issue with temperature compensation comes in with conductivity. So if you're measuring conductivity in USP water, then you would have a reading. You'd engage the USP programming. You'd have your temperature compensated reading, and then you'd also have your uh, what we call the raw conductivity reading, which has no temperature compensation. And then the unit does a calculation based on the difference between compensated and not temperature compensated. If it's within a certain delta, then you pass and you carry on reading uh, your conductivity and running your process. If it's not within that certain delta, then you go to the next, that's uh, test A, and test B, um, then you have to do some sampling, I think. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the USP procedures, but it's a three-step procedure, and it's a pass-fail. If you pass your procedure, then you don't have to go on to the next procedures. Uh, but I don't believe, and I could be wrong, but I don't believe that you would do anything different with your pH sensor in terms of temperature compensation. You have to temperature compensate it, or you're not going to have a correct pH reading, unless you're right at 7 pH, because at 7 pH, then... Uh, temperature compensation doesn't make any difference. And I hope I answered that. All right, that we one. have a few more questions. One is okay. from Stephen, and uh, his question is air venting in probes. And I'm air maybe a front end of that that we're missing, but maybe you can address, you know, air why is there air venting? Air venting. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll have two answers for that. Air venting. If you are measuring uh, high purity water, and you have a high purity sensor, that means that you've got a quarter inch tube feeding uh, water in and a quarter inch tube taking water out of your closed flow cell where you're measuring pH. The <clears throat> outlet of the flow cell will be higher than the inlet. And as you take your tube from the outlet, it, usually it'll be, sometimes I've seen just uh, like a, 12 inches of stainless steel, and then somebody's put a Tigon tube, and it's just dropping maybe down below to the sewer or down below to the sink. And that's a problem. You need an air vent or an air break, because if the, where the exit from the tube, if that's lower than the inlet into the flow cell, that pulls a vacuum. If you're old enough to have ever had to have drained a waterbed, you take a hose and put it through your bedroom window and then down into the waterbed, and you turn the water on and fill up the hose, and then you drop it off of the hose spigot, off the faucet, and it pulls all the water out because it's pulling a vacuum. So it even goes up higher, but since the hose is lower than where you have it in the waterbed, it pulls it all out. The same thing happens with uh, a high-purity system if that outlet is below the inlet. So you have to have an air break. Um, the other thing that you might have uh, in just a regular application is maybe uh, something like a, a filtrate master on a, um, a bleach plant 
uh, stock application where you're pulling out the fluid and avoiding the stock, and you run it by a pH sensor, and then it pulls an air sample by it um, to flush out the sample, and then it pulls the next sample. And this happens very quickly. Uh, it's on a really fast cycle. You get several cycles a minute um, of fluid and then air, fluid then air. Um, and those, that's a way to make that measurement because it's high pressure, it's fairly high consistency, so you have to pull that sample. And when they pull the sample by uh, the common method, because they do a lot of samples that way, not just for pH, but other items out of that bleach tower. Um, the common way to do it is pull the sample and then, and then it shoots air by it to blow it out and then sample again. That's really hard on pH sensors. They will not last as long in a process like that as if they were being rinsed by a water flush, you know, a liquid flush versus the air flush. Um, air is hard on a pH sensor because it goes in through the liquid junction and then if it's covered up by process fluid, you have air inside the liquid junction which eventually gets inside the reference. And you can imagine if it gets by the reference electrode, the reference electrode becomes unstable because the voltage uh, with the air bubbles around it becomes unstable. And so your pH sensor gets unstable and you have to throw it away. Um, those are the only two items I can think of in terms of air and pH sensors. Great. In a large flow-through process vessel that's agitated, Where's the best place to locate the pH sensor to get the most accurate reading? Well, you want it where you have the best mixing, and if you're going, if it's a submersion type, um, then um, you're going to have to put it in, obviously, where it's not going to get hit by an impeller or something. But you'd like to put it in so that the flow is going. 90 degrees to the face of the sensor. So if you were, um, so the flow would be, if you're looking down in the tank, the flow would be clockwise or counterclockwise around and around. And you want it someplace where you're getting good mixing. You also want it not near where you're dosing chemicals in, because you want to see the mixed reacted component, obviously. If you're seeing your chemicals, it'll, it'll slam that valve open and close, open, closed if you're controlling off the pH. Um, if you are, so you, you want to get it in there where it's the best mixed spot. If you are going to put it into the tank, say, through a ball valve insertion, then, again, you want to get it in the best mixed spot, but you want to try to avoid installing your sensor in the bottom of the tank because in the bottom of the tank, that's where gravity is going to take all the fines and everything, and it's going to settle out at the bottom. That will be a very dirty installation. You'll have to take it out and clean it a lot. You know, maybe the bottom of the tank is handy, and that's good, because if you install it there, you're going to have to take it out a lot and clean it. So you're better off trying to be someplace where you have flow at 90 degrees to the face of the sensor and where you don't have um, you don't have a lot of stuff crapping it up, like if it's at the bottom of the tank. Conversely, if you have a sealed tank uh, and you fill that tank up, you don't want to really put the sensor at the very top of the tank because, A, if the tank is not full all the time, it's going to be exposed to air and that's going to cause it to die and become unstable and then die. You'll have to throw it out. And if you're at the very top of that tank, especially if it's an agitated tank, you've got air bubbles in there. And we know that air bubbles are going to float to the surface. And when they bounce around on the face of the pH measuring electrode, they cause the, the measurement to be very noisy because you can't measure the pH of air. If you've ever held a pH sensor in air, you'll notice it just kind of starts wandering all over. It doesn't really hold on to a pH value. So the fix for that, if you have to go in to the top, is to try and install the sensor at a little bit of an uh, angle so that as the bubbles go up, they roll off. They don't actually impinge and get stuck around the liquid junction and on the measuring electrode. Uh, the other thing you can do with a noisy application like that is put a slight bit of damping. But you want to be really careful. You should talk to your chemist so you understand where you're at um, on that. Um, on that slope, your calibration slope for your um, for your process before you do that. 
Um, the other thing is if you're measuring if the tank has like a, a recirculation line, that would be the very best place to put it because then you have good flow. But you want to make sure if you go a horizontal line is best, somewhere between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock is usually ideal for a pH sensor uh, with flow at 90 degrees. If you're in a vertical line, you can put it in a vertical line, but you should never put it in a downflow line because downflow can have instantaneous periods of no flow. Uh, you can't guarantee that the pipe is always full, and you can suffer from water hammer, which will just beat the snot out of your pH sensor. So if you put it in a vertical pipe, it needs to be upflow for sure, and you need to know that that pipe is going to stay full all the time. But inline is going to get you a cleaner, uh, usually more accurate measurement than in tank. But if you have to do in tank, you want to try to keep bubbles off, keep keep it from crapping up, and give it like a 90 degree uh, flow past the face of the sensor if you can, because that will help keep it cleaner uh, and slow the poisoning of the reference down significantly. Excellent. Next question we have is, should I be stirring a sample while measuring or letting it go still? Uh, if you're if you've pulled a grab sample, or if you have taken your sensor out and cleaned it and rinsed it, and you're in a buffer, you should, for the in general, you should take the sensor that's going to be measuring in the beaker, you put it in, you swirl it around, and then you set it at the bottom and you let go and let it measure. Now, if you're measuring something like, um, you know, maybe three to five percent pulp stock uh, in, in a beaker like in the lab or whatever, you're probably going to have to stir it because you will see most certainly a difference in the reading with pulp stock uh, when it's stirred or not stirred. And that's because these weird, um, what do I want to say, you get this the fibers in the pulp stock actually get this charge potential. And it differs when it's being mixed and in motion versus when it's settled. And because you're measuring, you're comparing, if you're in a beaker, you're comparing to what's in the process, which is in motion. And so you want those fibers to have that same uh, potential on them because that potential uh, attracts or does not attract uh, depending on whether you have the potential or not, um, hydrogen ions. And so you can get a more acidic or a more basic reading uh, based on whether the fluid is in motion or not. It's a very interesting phenomenon that we discovered about, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago after doing a bunch of experiments trying to solve a problem for a customer. We couldn't figure out why it wasn't matching. Uh, and then we finally did some experiments and did figure it out and then did some more research. Now, I don't remember whether the potential when you're stirring it, if you're going to get more acidic or more basic and what, as compared to when you're not stirring it because it's been a very long time since I've looked at that research. I'd have to go back and look it up. But um, some fluids, you know, just based on their physical properties, if it's a slurry, uh, if it's an organic and aqueous mixture, like if you're doing a mass transfer operation between aqueous and organic, uh, those types of things you'll have to stir it for sure. But just a regular fluid that's you know mixed and reacted, etc., probably not. But with, when you put a pH sensor in a beaker of fluid, you definitely want to swirl it around so that everything gets mixed up because there's some stuff going to be coming off your sensor for sure. Um, and then you want to let it just sit still and be stable so that you're not uh, causing any added voltage to the pH measurement. I can grab the wire on a pH sensor and make it move by almost half a pH um, just from the um, innate, I don't know, magnetism or voltage or whatever in my body. And everybody has a different amount. Uh, so you want to let go of it. It's your electric personality, Georgie. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the uh, last question we have is cost of cleaning. Uh, what is the optimum concentration and temperature? Oh, my. Um, I would have to look that up. Um, can I close this uh, presentation, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whatever you show on your screen, we'll show, though. <laughs> okay. That's all right. I'm just going to look up a quick presentation 
Uh, let me think what I got here. I have to look at all my, I don't want that. It's the wrong thing. Um, here we go. So let me just find it real quick. What's something that it's cleaning? It's going to be from. Okay, maintenance, maintenance, sensor cleaning. Here we go. Let's go to this one. Okay, that's acid. Acid. Oh, let's see. Oh boy, it's not in here. Okay, I am going to have to search for that one. So let me just write a note. Um, so you want to use. And I, 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 I know the the uh, person that asked that question, Pete. So I'll I can get back to Pete on that answer. So okay. no no and problem there. Might be okay. Caustic is a cleaner concentration and temperature and time, of course. Um, and uh, I will I may need to know what we're cleaning off the sensor, but I'll try to get just a general answer on this, and then we can delve into it deeper if needed. Okay, I have a sticky okay, note great. for that. We, we can, uh, I can call Pete, too, and we can we can put a conference call together and, and get him a further answer specifically for his okay. application. Alrighty. That's the last question I have. Georgie, thank you very much for, for taking time out of your Halloween and uh, giving us this treat of a presentation. Excellent. Uh, well, I hope you all have a safe Halloween, and I'm going to have a safe Halloween and a happy Nevada Day. Today is uh, Nevada Day. Great. Thank you very much, Georgie. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.